Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new management practices. Thanks for tuning in, and welcome to the community. Hey folks, it's Shay here, and I'm grateful to have you back for another episode of Casual Cattle Conversations. Today, we are visiting with Dr. Mark Alley about parasite management, and what Dr. Alley is going to share with us is literally everything and anything about parasite management, why it matters to your herd, and what you can do, some sol- um, just really some solutions to help manage that yourself. We're going to dive into the economic implications of parasite management, um, if you aren't doing it, and if you do do it, what that looks like, as well as really where parasites come from, why they're a problem and really talk. We're going to cover all the bases today. So I'm excited about that. And before we do that, I want to remind you to head over to my website and subscribe to my weekly newsletter. So that way I can send you different industry news pieces and ranching resources every Wednesday. So that's a free newsletter. So go to my website and sign up for that. But with that, let's visit with Dr. Allie. Well, Dr. Ali, thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate you taking the time to come listen or to come talk to my listeners about parasite management and help give them some tips and strategies to improve their herd. Before we dive into some of the nitty gritty of the conversation, I would appreciate just a little bit of background information on yourself. So if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about what you're doing in the beef industry today, I would appreciate that. Sure. Um... So I work for Zoetis. I'm one of their technical service veterinarians. I'm based out of North Carolina, primarily covering the southeastern U.S. on the cow-calf and the stocker and background their operations. Um, get to see a lot of different operations, a lot of different things around the, around the country. Well, that's neat. So diving right into the conversation about parasite management, when we're talking about parasite management from a big picture perspective, why do cattle producers need to have somewhat of a management program in place for parasites? Yeah, we, we just have to remember that our our parasites are nutrient robbers. Their ultimate goal is to, is to steal from, from those cattle. And we have to be able to control that. Otherwise, we're going to leave uh, some economic performance on the uh, on the deck and these animals are not going to perform to their full genetic ability and we need to be able to understand how all those parasites fit not only the internal ones but also the external ones and how best to do a holistic uh, parasite control management program. So can you talk a little bit more about how they impact animal health and performance? Do you have more to share on that? Yeah so as I mentioned that parasites uh, they are nutrient robbers. They do a, a very nice job of making sure that they get, um, whether it's protein or energy from that cow to be able to survive and maintain themselves. We have to remember that 90% of the pasture, uh, 90% of the parasites are actually on the pasture and only about 10% of it are in the animals. So when we get ready to think about parasite control programs, not only do we need to look at uh, product specifically, but we also need to look at what we're doing from our pasture management uh, program because uh, that's where most of the parasites are going to be and we have to take that into account uh, when we develop our, our entire program including the discussion about refugia or at least leaving some parasites uh, that have not been exposed to our dewormers available and we do that best by uh, not treating every animal and, and there's still a lot to be learned in that front from the cattle side we've seen that happen quite a bit on the small ruminant side, we still don't have nearly as much data as, uh, as we would like to be able to make our best recommendations when we start talking about adding refugia in as, our, as a strategy for controlling parasites. Why, why is that currently part of the strategy? What's the logic behind that? So when we think about refugia, Refugia is a concept that's not only been used in livestock, but in other industries, both on the plant side uh, and the pesticide area as well. And it's a concept where what we want to do is we want to leave um, a population of what we're trying to control that has not been exposed to the molecule. We've done quite a bit of work on the small ruminant side, and they definitely have demonstrated an ability to um, effectively control parasites. 
we're not quite as advanced on, on the cattle side. And one thing we're trying to figure out is how do we determine which animals to treat and which animals shouldn't be treated? And we think about parasites in general. The parasites are most likely to affect our youngest animals. So those are the ones that we really want to focus our parasite control programs on. And the ones that probably um, can at least deal with some level of parasitism are our older animals. Um, there are some exceptions to that, especially in periods of drought or if they're nutritionally compromised. Um, one parasite, specifically the brown stomach worm, can cause a problem not only in the young calf, but also in older animals. Thank you for explaining that. And we'll dive into more of some of what you just talked about a little later on. But I want to touch on the economic impact side again. You already mentioned on earlier in the interview that ultimately, like, not controlling these parasites is going to impact the performance of the animal. And that's where that main impact comes in. Are there any numbers or figures you can share on the economic impact side? Yeah, it's it's a good question. Everybody wants to know that. Probably one of the most often quoted was some research that Dr. Lawrence did out of Iowa State. Unfortunately, it's fairly dated at this point. And what they did is they wanted to go through and determine if we took some of our technologies that we have available for us in the cattle industry, if we remove those, what would be the impact? And at the cow-calf level, the largest impact would be on our inability to to deworm animals. And using 2007, 2008 numbers, that uh, dollar figure was about $190 uh, per head at that time. Now, if you if you look at that, what it is today, as far as what our input cost and what the cattle are worth today, what the feed, feed costs are, all of those things, that economic advantage uh, or economic impact is probably much larger. Okay. Thank you for explaining that and sharing that information. So if there are listeners out there, those cattlemen and women who are wondering if they have a parasite problem, what are some things they could look for? Yeah, you know, being able to go out and look at an animal and determine that they have a parasite issue is, is very challenging because there we don't see nearly as many animals today that actually will kill our calves as what we did before we had some of our newer molecules become available. So some of the symptoms that we often um, assign to a parasite infection include things like rough hair coats, um, poor feed efficiency, and potentially depressed weight, weight gains. But unfortunately, the, the primary economic driver that we have a hard time unless we're actively measuring is the impact that they have on appetite. And we know that these parasites will cause these animals to not eat nearly as much as they would or even potentially change their grazing behavior. The other impact that we often forget about is if we have an animal that is um, heavily parasitized and it's had issues, uh, whether it be um, a viral infection or even if we're trying to vaccinate an animal and we have a heavy parasite load in that animal, the immune system will actually shift away from the virus or the vaccine and actually fight more toward the parasite. Consequently, we may not have nearly the impact um, that we want to our virus or bacteria or even to our vaccine. So when we get ready to start thinking about a parasite control program, making sure that we incorporate that with our vaccine program is very critical. Okay, so when we're thinking about cattle producers and all their different management strategies, one thing that, or a frequent theme that gets shared on this show is that they need to have a team to help, you know, manage everything because we can't be experts in any, everything. But to some degree, as cattle producers, we still need to understand, have a certain base knowledge of what we're doing to our cattle and why we're doing it. So with that, what are the core elements or core things that cattle producers need to understand about parasites? Because ultimately they'd be working with a veterinarian to help manage this anyways, but what do cattle producers really need to understand? Yeah, as we, as we mentioned there earlier, Remember that 90% of the parasites are in the pasture, 10% are in the animal. Those 10% in the animal, that's really the only thing that we can control. And the first step in that is actually understanding the life cycle and understanding when is the best time where we administer our molecules or active uh, parasiticides, when that's going to have the most impact. And 
your veterinarian definitely uh, is someone that you want to consult with and ask him or her to be able to help you with that. But some examples of that would be the brown stomach worm. Uh, the scientific name is Ostratagia. These parasites typically prefer cooler weather and um, other parasites like Coperia and Hamonchus, those parasites typically prefer uh, warmer weather. And as a result, when we we're picking our control products, we have to understand which of those parasites um, are most likely to be a problem at that time of year and also which animals are going to be um, most likely impacted. And then probably the most important thing, as we mentioned earlier, we really don't have any new molecules that are coming. So we have to be good stewards of what we have available to us. And one of the most important things is making sure that we dose the animals um, with it as close to an accurate weight as possible. Because one of the key things that leads to development of resistance, not only in cattle, but other species as well, is when we underdose those. So we need to take that uh, proper administration or proper dosing very, very uh, critically in our decision-making process. And then we also, when we get the dose correct, we also have to administer it appropriately, especially when it comes to some of our poor own products where sometimes uh, I had some colleagues that describe them as a, uh, a splash on or a pour at, uh, where we have more of the dewormer end up on the side of the chute or people there versus on the animal. And really following those label directions and applying those, uh, those products the way they should is a key for long-term parasite control. Absolutely. So you mentioned the understanding the life cycle of the parasite. Can you talk a little bit more about what that life cycle looks like? Yeah. So when we look at the life cycle of these parasites, in general, uh, what happens is the adults begin to lay eggs and those are passed out in the feces. And in most of the parasites, those will go through three molts in the environment. And that's very much dependent on what the moisture content is of the environment as well as the temperature. And when they get to that third molt to the what we describe as the L3 or the larval stage three, that's the infective stage of the larva. And what they do is they will then begin to kind of climb up the, the plant with the help of some moisture there. And then the adults or the calves will come along and eat that and ingest that, um, that parasite. And then it will go through an additional two molts within the, uh, the cow or the calf, and then they will begin laying eggs again. That typical timeline for that is going to vary a little bit between the species and the amount of time um, that they've been on grass. So maybe as early as 14 days. Uh, in general, we typically describe it as a 21-day life cycle, but there's also some parasites that uh, will be a little bit longer, but it's a, it's in general about three weeks for most of the parasites that we're concerned with. So my next question, you know, you talked about earlier how we're really looking at focusing on younger animals and treating those because they're going to be the most impacted. But at what times of year are we looking at controlling parasites or is it more, you know, maybe not the time of year, but the age of the animal? Yeah, so I think all of that has to go into that consideration when we talk about having that veterinarian involved. Um, a blanket deworming is probably where we deworm everything is probably not um, conducive to us having uh, effective products long term. We don't know what that long term is. Um, so examples where we may make that decision to go in and do that would be following the drought. And the best way to think about parasites and when they're most likely to create a problem is when we see that grass begin to grow and begin to green up, that's the period of time when the parasites are actually um, doing their, their best as well as far as their life cycle and their ability to create uh, infected larva that, that will impact the cow or the cat. Um, Do you have more to add on that? Yeah, I think I may. Uh, yep, I will. Uh, I'll add something here. So the other thing to think about uh, is remember there are certain species of parasites that have more of a problem in the cat. And those are parasites like Cuperia, Hamonchus, Matodirus. 
and we don't have very good efficacy with some of our macrocyclic lactones, or at least not consistently. So we can administer oral drench like valves and do a, a nice job of controlling those. We also have the option of uh, the addition of Valcor, who, which is a prescription product, which has two different active ingredients involved in it, that does a really good job of controlling both Papyria and the matter diarrhea, especially in those young animals. So for producers who are listening to this episode right now, I mean, there are listeners in all 50 states, different countries, all of that. How does any of this vary from region to region with different environments? Oftentimes what we want to do is we want to plug something into a calendar and we always want to do the same thing uh, at that time point with, uh, with the calendar. And as I mentioned, most of those parasites, uh, 90% of them are in the environment. So when we think about parasites, when they do the best, that's when temperatures are between 40 and 85 degrees and they also have um, some moisture there. So and also remember that they can't travel long distances. They live primarily in that bottom to two to three inches of the plant. So anything that we can do to either uh, reduce the intake of those parasites by controlling the height of our pastures or understand uh, when it's more likely to have a big parasite load, that's how we should actually incorporate our parasite control program to make sure that we have something that lasts long term. Okay. So you just touched on the pasture management side of, you know, controlling how short we are grazing those pastures to help control um, parasites. What Can you touch a little bit more on some products? I know you just mentioned a few a couple questions ago, but can you talk a little bit more about what products are available for producers to control parasites? Yeah, when we start looking at products that we have available to us in the cattle industry, we're actually fairly limited as to what we have. We really only have four primary families or active ingredients available, and each of those active ingredients has a different mechanism of action. So um, we really want to think through making sure we understand what those molecules are and how what they're most affected with uh, and which parasite and, and which animal we're, we're most likely to get our best results. So some examples of that. The first one are their benzimazoles, and these are typically described as the white dewormers. They're provided to the uh, host as, a, as an oral product, either as a drench or as a feed through. These uh, members of this ingredient family absorb within the system of the animal within about 12 hours. And either through direct exposure with the dewormer or some of its metabolites, this family of, of dewormers actually will destroy that tubulin and alter the ability of that parasite to uptake nutrients and basically um, that parasite starves to death. Some examples of that would be albendazole. The brand name of that product would be valbazin. Other examples would be the penbendazole or oxmendazole. This ingredient family is very effective against our adult forms of most of our parasites, uh, especially parasites like Papyria and homuncus. And then albendazole or valbazin also has a unique ability to actually kill flukes, which we haven't really talked much about, but every certain region of the country are more prone to issues with that, and, and especially other countries as well. Um, so the next one, the macrocyclic lactones, and they're provided either as an injectable or a topical administration. This is the most commonly used one in the U.S., uh, at least for control of parasites that we have today. And it really changed the industry when it became on the market in early to mid 80s. And it has the unique ability to not control only internal, but also has some impact on some of our external parasites, as well as controlling some of the inhibited or arrested larvae uh, that may, uh, may occur. And the way it does this is it actually paralyzes the bodily function and then the parasite gets passed out uh, as the digestive move through the intestines. Some examples of this will be products like Bormectin, the brand name Dectamax. Other options will be Ivermectin, Moxidectin, or Epimectin. And these are, as I mentioned, very effective against our brown stomach worm, especially Ostratasia, and does also have some impact on some of our inhibited forms uh, of this particular parasite. We also have the unique ability to call it uh, kill some biting lice, specifically with the forearms. Uh, and we also, if you're using injectables, the sucking lice, uh, we do have some uh, good control of those as well. 
the third class or the third family or the metathiosomes. And these are provided to the animal either as an injectable or oral. And these also will paralyze the parasite. They just have a different mechanism of action um, compared to our microcyclic lactones. And some examples of this would be uh, the newest product, Valcor, which is a combination of Lormectin and Levamisole. There's also Levamed and Prohibit that are available as oral products, not commonly used on the cattle side. And these, um, as I mentioned, also paralyze the parasite, but they don't have a lot of uh, residual activity. We reach peak blood concentrations in less than 12 hours and do a fairly rapid kill on those parasites. And then the final one is the ben benzene sulfonamides, and these are provided as an injectable. And the most um, one that we have in the U.S. is a product called Chlorcelon, and it is primarily um, associated with damaging the uh, glycolytic process or the energy process in liver flukes. And then basically they starve to death as well. The example that we would have here is um, Ivamec Plus, and that's the Chlorcelon uh, molecule. All right. Well, thank you for walking through those different ingredient families, products, and what they do differently compared to each other. So, Dr. Alley, you have mentioned Valcor a couple times in this conversation. Can you go into a little more detail about what Valcor is? Yeah. So, let's just introduce Valcor to complement our product line of Dectamax and Valbazin that we've always, always had. So, Valcor is a combination of Dormectin and Levamisol provided as a prescription for cattle producers that provides both broad spectrum uh, parasite control for internal and external parasites with the convenience of a single injection. It's the first approved dual insecticide, and we start looking at parasite control programs and ways that we can fight parasites in general. The Using two active ingredients uh, is one of our most effective ways of doing that. In a study where we had heifers, 770 head of heifers treated, um, we had a fecal egg count reduction of 99% compared to 85% of those animals. Went. Heifers treated with Valcor had a fecal egg count reduction of 99% compared to 85% of heifers that were treated with a megalomectin product. And this parasite control actually helped to uh, result in a 9.3 pound increase in total weight gain over a 56 day study. We've also completed additional multi-site studies uh, with over a thousand head of both naturally and artificially infected parasites, demonstrating we have um, good efficacy in a variety of geographies and a variety of uh, different cattle. And in those studies, we've seen 99 to 100% reduction in egg counts in those, in, those, uh, in those studies. So looking back at that veterinary client patient relationship, what do cattle producers need to be sharing with their veterinarian to make sure that they are controlling parasites properly for their operation? Yeah, I think uh, I think we need to, as we mentioned, do it as a holistic approach and not only just look at the internal part of it, the parasites or internal parasites, but also our, our external parasites. We really develop a program that's going to cover all of those because if... Um, if we don't do that, we may actually lose some effectiveness of some of our products. And the best way you can help your veterinarian to be able to manage these is help them to understand what your goals and what your priorities are. What are the things that you've had issues with in the past? How do you market cattle and how do you bring cattle in? All of those things are a key component to developing an effective parasite management control program. Alrighty. Well, as we start to wrap up, Dr. Alley, if producers are out there and wondering where to start, what small step can they take to start making progress on this portion of their operation? I think one of the first things is, as we mentioned there earlier, make sure that you give the proper dose at the right time um, to control the parasites or parasites that you're targeting. Also, we probably need to incorporate some diagnostic like fecal egg count reductions to determine how effective our programs are and do we need to make some changes in those. And we have to think about everything we're doing in, in our parasite control product selection. Because if our target that what we're trying to do, for example, is to control flies and we're using a forearm dewormer to do that, 
we're also exposing those internal parasites at the same time and probably at an inadequate or a lower dose than what we want. And as a result, we may end up developing some resistant parasites that may impact uh, that particular ingredient family is effectiveness in, in controlling long-term uh, or controlling parasites long-term. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining me for an episode of Casual Cattle Conversations. Consult your veterinarian for assistance in diagnosis, treatment, and control of parasitism. Do not treat cattle with Valcor within 15 days of slaughter. Not for use in female dairy cattle 20 months of age or older, including dry dairy cows. Not for use in beef calves less than 2 months of age, dairy calves, and veal calves. Safety has not been evaluated in breeding bulls. Use with caution in cattle treated with cholinesterase inhibitors. This product is likely to cause injection site swelling. Tissue damage, including granulomas and necrosis, may occur. These reactions have resolved without treatment. See full prescribing information at valcortuff.com pi. Dectamax injectable has a 35-day pre-slaughter withdrawal period. Dectamax poron has a 45-day pre-slaughter withdrawal period. Do not use in female dairy cattle 20 months of age or older. Do not use in calves to be processed for veal. Dectamax has been developed specifically for cattle, ants, or swine. Use in dogs may result in fatalities. Cattle must not be slaughtered within 27 days of their last treatment with valvazine. Do not use in female dairy cattle of breeding age. Do not administer to female cattle during the first 45 days of pregnancy or the four... 45 days after removal of bulls. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.